going the way you're going, you end up as a bum on the street. You train. You fight harder than those other guys, and you win. You can take it. You can make it. You can do this, Lou. You just gotta believe you can. Pop does. Ma does. I do. Louie, a moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. Hi everybody, it's Bina007 back for another 10 minutes spoiler-free movie review. Today of the World War II biopic Unbroken, which has been on release for a little time now, but I was so affected by this film, I thought it was worth reviewing anyway. I think one of the least edifying moments of the Sony hack was seeing producer Scott Rudin lambast Angelina Jolie for having very little talent. And I think he felt very jealous that she had abandoned his Cleopatra project to direct her own passion project, Unbroken. So I sat down to this film, perhaps a little sceptical. I hadn't seen her previous directorial efforts. But I have to say that I found it to be a technically accomplished, deftly handled and genuinely moving film, in contrast to some of the more mawkish, films that had tried to manipulate me into feeling inspired. And by that, I'm talking about the theory of everything. Um, In contrast, Unbroken really left me deeply affected. And there are certain striking visual moments that stay with me long after I've seen it. So to go back to the beginning, this movie is based on the story of Louis Zamperini, who was an Italian-American at a time when to be such was to be target of racism. And he was a little kid um, in trouble, petty trouble, with a loving family who uh, really found his calling in life when his big brother encouraged him to run track. And he turned out to be exceptionally talented. He raced in the controversial Berlin Olympics just before World War II and actually won the bronze medal for a last lap break, which the film wants us to see as emblematic of how he survived World War II, which is using that last reserve of energy to push past the pain barrier and make it when all others have lost their stamina to survive. This story of Louis's sporting achievements, which arguably could have been a film all of their own, is told very briefly and in flashback. The movie actually opens in media res with a airplane fight, a skirmish, above the sun-drenched skies of the Pacific, in the sun-drenched skies of the Pacific, uh, between American and Japanese soldiers. And I have to say, you know, Angelina Jolie, this is no mean feat to direct this very dynamic, um, this very dynamic airplane fight. And it reminded me a little of, of Brad Pitt's recent turn in Fury, insofar as that aimed to situate us very firmly inside a World War II tank battle and show us what it must have been like. And some of the scenes in this air fight where Zamperini, who is a bombardier, has to sort of clamber out onto exposed parts of the plane in the midst of battle are just absolutely exhilarating. And kudos to her for pulling it off. The first half of the film really is the story of of this airplane crew, the first skirmish and then a second search and rescue mission, which ends up with them crashing over the Pacific, ironically, because they're flying a plane that's too decrepit to stay in the air. And the three pilots and the three soldiers, Louis, his friends Phil and Mac, end up in this tiny rubber dinghy in the middle of nowhere. And it's a complete physical and mental battle to survive. They have very little food. Um, They're dehydrated. (laughs) They're surrounded by circling sharks. And more importantly, um, infiltrated by pessimism. You know, they, they roll past the day's survival record. Still no sign of anybody on the horizon. And it's there that you see Louis's determination to come out and also his questioning of of why he's coming out and what for his his friend Phil is a deeply and quietly religious man and it's there that you see the awakening in Louis of what will become a, a newfound faith so eventually as we move through the first half of the film 
The boys are rescued, but alas, not by the Americans, but the Japanese, and thrown into a succession of prison camps. And the conditions are grim, ever more grim. Um, starvation, abuse, sadistic treatment that really would break you physically, if not mentally. Um, and there are some striking visual images. One that will definitely stay with me is of an emaciated of emaciated soldiers stripped naked, kneeling down, ex fully expecting to be executed. And another very um, striking tableau I will remember is soldiers working in the middle of nowhere in a Japanese prison camp um, hauling coal buckets on their shoulders and covered, covered in coal dust. Like one of those pictures of 1920s British coal mines, but even more cruel than that. It's absolutely striking. But what really comes out in the second half of the film and powers it on is the relationship between Louis Zamperini and one of the Japanese prison guards who the Americans have nicknamed the bird. Um, this character goes beyond the textbook cruelty of Japanese prison camp guards. He singles out Louis in what I can only describe as an obsessive love-hate relationship that reminded me very much of the relationship between Epps and Patsy in 12 Years a Slave. There's something very psycho, maybe psychosexual going on here that's absolutely fascinating and enigmatic. And I have to give great praise to the Japanese actor Takamasa Ishihara, who plays the bird, because he does these absolutely horrific things to Louis, this character. Physical endurance, mental torture... And yet, somehow in this performance, you feel sympathy for this man because you can tell that he himself is as tortured as Louis by what he's doing. He is as embattled and trapped. And I think it's fascinating that in the real life story of Louis Zamperini, who went on after, after World War II to preach forgiveness and actually ran, um, carried what is one of the torchbearers in the recent Tokyo Olympics, um, that the bird would not, would not meet with Louis. And I think that's probably testament to how searing that relationship was for him, far more so than for Zamperini himself. So as you can imagine, this film plays out in very distinct parts. You have the sort of the classic World War II action film. You have the, not sepia-tinted, but certainly the sporting underdog flashback film. You have what can almost seem like animal horror in the second part of that first half where they're being encircled by sharks and there are definitely some Jaws-like jumps. I literally jumped out of my seat at one point. And the second half of the film plays like a classic wartime prison drama. A while ago there was a fantastic Hungarian-Jewish historical film starring Ray Fiennes called Sunshine because the, the family had changed their name to Sonnenschein. And he played a Hungarian Olympic fencer and similarly, post-war, when he was in a communist prison camp, was targeted and they tried to break him and he wouldn't be broken. And I think there's um, there's definitely a genre of movies that, that do these sorts of stories. But I think it's absolutely testament to Angelina Jolie that although there are very distinct uh, genre within this film, it, it hangs together. It never feels clunkily and episodically put together as some of these films can. But really, the main thing I want to convey is how much I admire the way in which she conveys humanity without being manipulative. So even in quiet moments between, say, Louis and his two friends in the dinghy, the, the, the camaraderie, the, the questioning between them feels so real, and, and in particular praise for Donald Gleason here, who plays Phil. And then later on in the prison camp, great camaraderie. I love, um, there's a little cameo role from Garrett Hedlund, who was in the, the recent Tron reboot, as the sort of, oh, he plays it like one of those classic Hollywood movie, The Great Escape, cool and calm and strong, and yet he's not the hero. But it did make me think that I'd love to see um, a Great Escape type movie featuring him. He was absolutely fantastic. Some reviewers whom I respect have, have criticised this film for being very conventional. And I think it's true that it feels conventional insofar as this is a straightforward World War II biopic. They're, they're not doing anything too flashy with the structure of the film, nor even of the shooting style, which, as I said before, it's very classic. And I think, you know, Roger Deakins, who is oh, one of my all-time favourite cinematographers, has created a bleached, sun-drenched look that is, 
it does remind you of those classic wartime films. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to acknowledge where you sit in the frame of reference here. It's a handsome production. It's a really beautifully shot, beautifully crafted, beautifully acted film. And I have to say, the young actor Jack O'Connell, but if you've seen this film and agree or disagree with my take, please feel free to leave a comment on the blog at beena007.com.